This episode of Serverless Chats is sponsored by DexSecure. This week, Rebecca and I look back at some of our favorite moments from the last 30 episodes. This is Serverless Chats, episode number 137. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Daly. And I'm Rebecca Marshburn. And this is Serverless Chats. Hey, Rebecca, how are you doing? Jeremy, I am doing really well. And, you know, it's been, there's been some ups and downs. And uh, I'm just really excited for this episode today. I, I, like, should I say what it is? No, let's banter first. Do you want to banter? No, I think we, I think we have to keep people on the edge of their seat. So, well, so these ups and downs, I mean, we, so the, the listeners should know we took a couple of weeks off from recording. We've recorded a whole bunch of episodes. We've got a bunch of really great episodes coming up as well, but we kind of, you know, I went on vacation. I think you, you know, you, you had some interesting stuff happen to you. So, I mean, yeah, maybe let's start there. What, what is the most interesting thing that happened to you in the last couple of weeks? Yeah. So I think there are two things. One, uh, my car was stolen. Still well, has not, not been returned, but it, so like in a, you know, I guess it's a, I wouldn't even say it was stressful. There's like nothing I could do to control it other than, you know, file the police report and exactly what one might do. And, uh, but there was a levitus moment where the police were like, hey, we'll probably get your car back when people steal a car in Seattle. It's usually just so they can do crimes. And I was like, oh no, you think ah. she's, you think she's out doing crimes? And they were like, oh yeah, <laughs> she's doing crimes. And just the phrase <laughs> doing crimes and like imagining my car, like turning to this other side, just on a hard oh. knock life doing crimes. Um, right. I mean, that's a thing. I mean, you, you love them. You, you know, you keep them, you know, you try to keep them safe and then they just, they grow up and they go out and they start doing crimes. It's crazy. Doing crimes. Um, so that was, you know, a, an unexpected, maybe a low light, if you will. And um, I appreciated this car very much. Highlight is that Common Room, where I'm the head of community, won Startup of the Year last night at the GeekWire Awards. And I really, That's amazing. I really will say, like, we were not expecting it. It's a really big honor. And it was really, it was a big highlight. So, anyway, enough about me. You went to Hawaii and you met a celebrity. We did. Yeah. My, I took my family to Hawaii. We've been uh, planning this trip for 25 years, I think. I can't remember. It's been a while um, that we've been wanting to go. So we finally got out there and it was my daughter's 16th birthday and we were on Oahu and we were at, uh, I forget the name of it now, but some, some blowhole thing where like, you know, the water comes up and splashes blowhole. and there's this little yeah, well, that's what they call it, a blowhole. It's some, <laughs> some whatever it is. But there's this little secret cove, which isn't very secret because you can see it from the road, but they call it a secret cove. Um, we can go down there and you can swim and there's a couple of rocks you can jump off of and whatever. So we go down there and uh, we're walking around and we see this giant man. I mean, giant, just start like, you know, it, come out of the water. Um, and he, he puts crocs on, you know, that are the, that are about the size of a canoe, giant, whatever. And my uh, my oldest daughter says, I think that's Rob Gronkowski. And when I'm looking, I'm like, that is Rob Gronkowski. So me, I just like run over to him. I, I was cool about it though. Like I fist bumped him and I was like, hey, Gronk, what's going on? And, you know, I tell him I'm from Boston and whatever. So we had a good conversation. And, uh, and then the funny thing was, is that I took a selfie with him. And then I, I said, let's get a picture with the family. And his fiance, who I still don't, I, I totally forgot her name, but she's a, a swimsuit model or a supermodel, whatever she is. Uh, I, I just casually asked her, I said, hey, can you take a picture of my family with the Rob Gronkowski? Uh, and she did. So she was probably quite offended by that at the end. But oh, I mean, here's Rob Gronkowski, six feet, seven inches tall or something like that. I'm six feet and this guy's towering over me. So, yeah, we just ignored her and just got this great, <laughs> uh, this great photo with uh, Rob Gronkowski. Well, I was really delighted to receive that photo when I when we had talked about how your travels were going. And honestly, if there's anything I believe or maybe believe the least, it's that you were super cool about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry, I was super cool about it. I'm like, I don't know if either of us are super cool about anything, but we'll I mean, try what would have been great is he was like, Hey, aren't you that serverless guy? I mean, that would have been cool. I <laughs> yeah. mean, if there was like a mutual celebrity respect <laughs> thing, I mean, I I mean you know, maybe. But anyways, so look, we've, uh, you know, took a little bit of time off, like I said, but I think one of the things that we've done over the last, you know, many, many, many weeks and months and so forth is, and we've talked to a lot of really interesting guests and we were counting them up the other day. 
And we're up to 30 episodes that we recorded together. And of course, we've had a number of amazing guests, but I also, you know, I really enjoy talking with you as well. So I figured, what if we did an episode where we just talked about some of the past guests that we had, have a little chat about it, maybe pick out some of our favorite moments and so forth. And I was thinking about, you know, 30 episodes and I, you know, I sent you a message and you said, oh, 30 episodes, that's it. And that made me think very much of like, it does seem like we've done more than that, but it's sort of like being married. Like I've been married for almost 19 years, but if people ask me, I'm like, I don't know, like 50. I don't know. It's just every day <laughs> has been a blessing. But yeah, so yeah, that I think uh, I think this will be fun. Yeah, I also think so. 30 episodes, but we have been podcasting together and recording for about a year, a little over a year, right. I believe. And so that's probably it, right? Because we record a bunch of episodes, then we take some time off for the holidays and for the summer, and as like let people catch up on episodes. So. The numbers and the math does work out, but I think because the time has been longer than that. Right. But just so people know, I mean, Jeremy and I, you know, selected some of our favorite moments. And when I say selected, we literally have over 19 pages of notes of our favorite moments. And so we're not going to go through necessarily all 19 pages and a lot of it's text that we'll actually just listen to the audio. But it is hard to pick our favorite moments because we have interviewed so many incredible guests. So... Thank you for this to all of our guests for all 19 pages of all these moments that Jeremy and I truly feel grateful to have been able to record with you all. Without further ado, Jeremy, do you want to kick us off on what we believe is maybe our thesis favorite moment? I would. I do want to say something about the length of this here. Like this, this podcast is six and a half hours long today. So, you know, maybe take a bath Buckle and break up. if you want to. No, uh, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to keep it. We're going to try to keep it a little bit short. So, uh, so yeah. So I think, you know, the, the one that we should start with, and this is a guest that I had been wanting to get for a very, very long time. I just, I find it really interesting. Um, the work that he's done and sort of, you know, in terms of serverless, I mean, this is sort of the guy when you think about it in terms of, of driving the innovation around that or at least driving the organization that is driving the innovation around that. And that's Dr. Werner Vogels. And we were lucky enough to have him on the show. And we asked him a whole bunch of questions. And again, you know, you get you get uh, some of his answers that are very PR related and so forth. And I think that there was an interesting moment during the show where I asked him about, are we at a point with serverless where, you know, we've sort of built all the tools that need to be built or are there some other sort of major tools that, that need to be built? So let's listen to this and then, uh, and then we can talk about it a little bit, but uh, I loved his comment at the end. So I, I think what we've seen, if you go beyond Lambda, uh, I think if you just look at the Lambda ecosystem itself, uh, layers, uh, Sam, all these other tools, earlier tools, actually all, all have helped to become more efficient. But I also think you have to look at the complete ecosystem around it. Uh, API gateway, event bridge, you know, and, and then take, take everything else. Take, take SQS, take DynamoDB, take S3. I mean, all of them are serverless. Yeah, and I switch the integration between them becomes, is always important, but also how easier can we make it to build solutions on top of this? Because in essence, you know, yeah, I mean, we can, we can talk a little about, a lot about sort of this one function that you want to build, but in the end, our systems are slightly more complex than that one function. Yeah. And so I think step functions have become a crucial tool. Mm. In all of that, yeah, because again, you see, we always slam down and it's fun because you thought, oh, you know, you deliver this file or this, this message in this queue or whatever, and this one function gets triggered. Well, it turns out it's never one function. Yeah. And it is then so many customers had to start doing all the heavy lifting again. They had to figure out, oh, has this function failed? What are the steps that they need to do after this function has failed? Yeah, and so building step functions, for example, has, I think, greatly improved the composition model uh, for for Lambda, but but I can never uh, see Lambda separate of all the other pieces that we have because I think serverless is just as important for for those areas. I mean, when um, now Redis, uh, the Redshift serverless, mm. yeah, you know, we have to figure out except how many of these pillars do you, do you, do you need, or you know, Aurora. Uh, RDS, I mean, all of this, uh, they take RD, RDS is also one of these sort of old fashioned kind of things where we started off with, yeah, in essence, you know, we had object storage, we had a network and security and things like that, EC2, in a database because everybody needed a database. Yeah, but in the beginning, definitely RDS still meant that you had to manage your database. 
Right. Yeah, and anything you want to do, do you want to have it? it do you want to scale up? Do you want to scale down? Things like that. Yeah, very impossible. No, it was also software built by other people, of course, largely. And because it was my SQL or Postgres. But then moving those to a serverless architecture means then suddenly, hey, you know, you take away, again, the heavy lifting around it. And then it also gave us the opportunity to do this, this massive innovation under the covers that became Aurora. Because I think the, the, the sort of log file layout is a complete departure from how we used to build relational databases. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> thinking, thinking about. Myself, <laughs> no, but for me, serverless is still, you know, it's just, I still get annoyed by every piece of AWS that is not serverless. <laughs> So I still get annoyed by every piece of AWS that is not serverless. That honestly, I mean, I know we haven't printed bumper stickers yet, and maybe they've gone out of style, but when he said that, I think both you and I were like, can we bring bumper stickers back? I still right. get annoyed by every piece of AWS that is not serverless. And I think both of you and both you and I were like, do we get to keep this in? Is that something that, let's say, right. I mean, obviously... Dr. Werner Vogels is, you know, a huge messenger for Amazon and AWS as a whole, or Amazon as a whole, AWS. And so we were like, you know, how many things do we get to, does he get to be super opinionated about? And how many things does it have to be a little bit more, let's say, scrubbed? And so we were like, do we get to keep this? And, and yeah, that's his opinion. And that's how he feels. And we get to keep it. And you and I, I think, love, just love that, that line. Yeah, I think there was a I think there was a moment there that it was a little bit unscripted, right? And and the other thing that was interesting too is he talked about all these services before Lambda that are considered serverless. Now, I just did a talk about this too to basically say, you know, for quite a lot of time from 2006 to 2014, they're developing all these different services that are essentially serverless. But it wasn't until Lambda came along and there was a little bit more sort of, uh, you know, of an ecosystem built around or that connection that it became sort of this idea that uh, these server or services were serverless. So it is encouraging, too, to think that this is the direction that uh, AWS wants to go or certainly the direction I think that, uh, uh, that, that Werner wants to go. So it is interesting, but it's also interesting to think about where we are now or sort of where we were going around the time that uh, that Lambda was released um, and maybe some people who might have been thinking about that beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for this wonderful setup, Jeremy. We, it's like it's like we talked about this, but one of the moments that I was really excited to highlight that you and I talked about was Jonas Bonaire. And it's this idea of, I guess I let the cat out of the bag. Maybe I was supposed to introduce it without saying who it was first, but what was so interesting about talking with him is that he had written the reactive manifesto, which had, you know, almost 32,000 signatures on it. Um, and he had written about how the idea that reactive systems are responsive, they're resilient, they're elastic, and they're message driven. And I think he had done that in like 2004 or something like that. And so that was, what was that, 10, 11, 12 years before the release of, of Lambda. But it was right. sort of this idea of like, Okay, how did you, how were people thinking about this a decade before? And then how did that evolve into something that ended up being something like AWS Lambda in the serverless ecosystem? So let's listen to a bit of our conversation with Jonas. And I wish I could say, yes, I saw you know, this like serverless coming. I, I, but then I probably would have invented it, like instead of writing that, <laughs> that, 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 that document, you know, I, it's, it's, it's not, it's not that simple. It's always easier to like to, to put one and one together when you look back, you know, right. <laughs> harder, harder to predict the future, but, 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 you know, but, but sure, you know, halfway yes as well you know because i i knew where i wanted the the you know the industry to go when it comes to tackling these new challenges uh, uh um when when building things for you know the upcoming cloud building things for the great infrastructure you know amazon started to provide and and others as well and 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 um, I, I you know the reason for writing it was that it was when i was out talking to a lot of people you know aka has been around for about five years back then and it was People didn't really understand why and how they should conceptualize about these new type of systems. And right. so what I tried to do is like distill it down to, to some core principles and, 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 and make it easier to, easier to, to, to grasp, you know, the, the gist of it is of course, very superficial in a way. And this is, that's the reason why I, you know, I, I, I added the, the in this document around reactive, 
principles it goes a little bit more into into depth trying to explain what reactive systems is all about but anyway you're not really trying to give a common vocabulary having one way of looking at, the, at it so so people can communicate and talk about the systems in the same way and also you know a little, little bit like call for arms you know this is what we have to do as an industry this is where we're going we better get get like get prepared and and, and join forces on trying to you know invent this future as like Alan Kay would say. So, so it's, um, that's, that's really what it was all about. And, and uh, I wish I would have come up with, with like, you know, with the Lambda serverless experience. I didn't, you know, but that was, that, that sort of followed these, these ideas, I suppose. Uh, uh, while the reactive systems is more like the groundwork on how the system should, should work and how we should design these type of systems. Well, uh, I'm going to I'm so. going to give you more credit than you give yourself, because I do think that it was it was very forward looking. Um, and uh, and I and I would be surprised if that document wasn't brought up in some of those early planning meetings. <laughs> and Thanks, you're actually you. you're actually going to get a second chance right now because uh, it is I'm certainly hard to predict the future. But we often ask a lot of our guests to say, like, hey, where do you see serverless in five years? But we don't usually have guests that are actively trying to shape that future of serverless. And so if we were going to predict the future, and perhaps you're going to write another manifesto about what's coming, um, two questions. Where do you think serverless is going? And where do you want it to go? Are they aligned? Yeah, I, 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 have, I have two passions. And I think, I think they, they are aligned. I think we're going there. And I think we have, we have to go there. And, and and the first one is 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 around the user experience. You know, even even the even the even the serverless is is was really groundbreaking when it comes to that. You know, of course, more has to be done around around the user experience and 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 you know the whole tool chain from developer tools, you know, through the CI tools, staging all the way up, and 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 also you know around the the programming models. That's also part of the user experience and how you actually resonate reason about these these type of systems. A lot of interesting work is being done there, but I think more work need need to be done. And that's you know some a place where we're really trying to 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 think hard what what it would mean. Uh, I think that's like will sort of make it or break it for ser for serverless unless we 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 make it super accessible. It already is, but you know, I I think we can do even better. You know, and then 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 everyone will not start using it, which I think it deserves. Uh, so there's of course more more to say, but 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 off to the next one I th that I think is equally important for me at least. You know, perhaps and it, is, it might be a little bit more early days, but that is the move to the to the edge. And, and, yeah. and how how this how this you know the new new type of infrastructure we're getting is, you know things like five five G for example with the with 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 the with you know the vision of having like like hundreds of like millions of, of points of presences like even now like essentially in your in your backyard where you can have like local groups communicating a little bit more like off. Uh, you know, off, offline and, you know, and having all this super optimization that can be done with 5G, uh, you know, being able to push serverless up in that realm and, and having hybrid solutions, because it won't just happen overnight. Right. We, we, we will, we'll still have, you know, old cloud infrastructure, old in quotes, you know, but, but you know, traditional cloud infrastructure that want to communicate with these edge clusters and, and, and do it efficiently. And, and how do you program for that? So, yeah, so I really love that conversation with Jonas because I think it was sort of, uh, you know, it's the same sort of thing I've been thinking about quite, for quite some time. This idea where, like, you've got to make serverless more accessible for people, right? And you kind of have to get them out of their, own, their old mindsets. Indeed. And I think we've had some amazing conversations with some amazing guests. And a couple of whom, one in particular, really helps us and, and others can conceptualize what it means to get out of a mindset and what it means to say things from a new way. Right. And I think if there's anybody who can talk about sort of planning for the future or maybe mapping for the future, uh, Simon Wardley, uh, we had him on episode 110. And you actually asked him this exact question about how do you sort of get people um, to sort of shift that mindset and start looking forward to serverless. And, and of course, we named the episode The Inevitability of Serverless. Because I think it's quite clear from this conversation here that uh, it's happening whether you want it to or not. So I'm, I'm going to be, uh, oh, I've been blunt enough anyway, I'll be brutally honest. Is that <laughs> most inertia I don't find in, in people, uh, in, in engineers, uh, uh, people doing the actual work. 
most of the inertia I actually find in the management layer and in the executive layer. Um, so where inertia occurs, so I, I, for example, one gov a government department um, uh, very much resisting the shift to cloud, mainly because the system zapping people within there and their managers were like, you know, well, we can't do that. Um, because the vendors were in there saying, well, if it goes to cloud, you're all going to be at the job and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it was quite simple just to say, well, look, you know, we don't want to shift to cloud, actually. You know, totally agree. Because the runtime shifting. Uh, and so what we want to do is build up here, which, of course, means that all the people will have to retrain up there. And, of course, that creates a problem because those people will suddenly become incredibly valuable because this was 2016, 2017. They would become valuable over time. So we'll have to make sure we... And all of a sudden, all the inertia dissipated, all the sort of arguments, because you gave people a path, a path to go. Um, so one of the things I use with maps is I use the maps, I apply economic patterns to it, I look at points of inertia, and then, then you can directly counter. There's strategies for all different 16 forms of inertia that you can counter. But the most important thing when it comes to people is give them a path. Um, I, I hate this when people talk about people as resources or things like that as like disposable assets and it's just a horrible way of thinking about things um and i i generally find that people aren't resistant to change uh what they're resistant to is having a bunch of management consultants come in and telling them they're fired while we're employing somebody else to do so not being given the chance that's what i generally find so um in terms of um, when it comes to um, uh, adopting service, you've got several problems. One, um, uh, executives like to talk about we have a strategy and it failed because execution wasn't right, which is just a way of blaming other people for the fact the strategy was wrong in the first place. Uh, and so you've got to be very mindful of the fact that you're going to have inertia within the uh, executive areas, particularly talking about loss of empire, you are going to have inertia within people doing the actual work if no one's given them a path forward. Um, those things are fairly normal. So it's a good idea to map it out and find people a path and tell people where we're going to attack and how we're going to attack it as well. Um, you're going to have inertia coming from the vendors. The vendors will always tell you that, you know, you can have the future just like the past. So your capital investment, you know, we can make sense of that. We can turn your great big data center into a private cloud. It can outcompete Amazon. They're going to tell you all that stuff as long as it sells them more service. So you, you've got to be mindful of those sorts of things. Um, the um, I, One of the other big problems is, of course, once you get into serverless, you're really tying value uh, down to, um, you know, where you're spending money. So this is like capital flow in applications. Unfortunately, most organizations have very poor understanding of the landscape, very poor understanding of the value that things create. Um, if they if they actually map to it, then it becomes a lot easier to do this sort of stuff. Uh, this is why you should definitely talk to Dave Anderson and, or, or from Liberty Mutual. I mean, that, that's a great example. Or, or Drew, Drew Fermont is a, a, is a capital right. one, another great one. Um, so generally, I found inertia always, um, if you can have an honest discussion, and for that, I use a map, uh, and, and we talk about, you know, what's changing, where we're going to have inertia, and we talk about the inertia that we have, and how we're going to tackle this, these issues, how we're going to give people a path forward, um, because we're going to need them. We're going to need them just working in a different area. I, I always find it's relatively easy to overcome. As long as you do the thinking beforehand, right. okay. Does, do we, if do you just announced do we're doing this great big change program, <laughs> it's all going to serverless, and the vendors are coming in saying you're all going to lose your jobs, uh, then you're going to have problems, okay. So, so I generally find it's in the executive plan. A little insight for our guests who can't see us seeing each other. Actually, when we were listening back to this clip, you heard a certain sentence, and you're like, "Man, I love that line." Uh, and so maybe highlight that for folks, because I also love that line and I love that it still gets you even listening it back. And this has been probably the 30th time you've heard this back. Yeah. And, and this is and again, Simon has so many great quotes that are in there. But the line that I'd love to highlight is where he says, you know, executives like to talk about, you know, we have a strategy and it failed because the execution wasn't right. 
um, which is just a way of blaming other people for the fact that the strategy was wrong in the first place. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's palpable, powerful, and something where you're always like, oh my gosh, the strategy being wrong. How do I, how do I ensure it from like first principles that even that foundation is correct? I think I see a lead into the next piece that I want, that I, that we want to talk about. But before I go there, is there anything else you want to leave us with in terms of takeaways from this conversation with Simon? Yeah, well, I mean, I think what he's talking about there, certainly with there being a lot of resistance at uh, at a stra- at a strategic level, right? And again, it's it's one of those things where I always find a lot of companies, especially when you get to larger companies, they they tend to lead from behind, right? So there's not a lot of innovation there. And I think you see this even happening with AWS at this point now, where it's like you've got so many services and they're starting to tweak these things, but you're not seeing the level of innovation that you're seeing from like. Cloudflare, for example, because they're more nimble, they can move a little bit faster, um, and they can kind of they can kind of do that. So this idea of you know not thinking through strategy and just assuming that you know if your strategy is outdated or it's not forward looking, then you're you know then you're going to go ahead and blame the execution when in reality it's just you weren't looking far enough ahead. And and the predictability of some of this stuff, I, it's kind of crazy because I you know if you look back at how predictable cloud was and cloud adoption and some of these other things, you know, if Simon was right about that, you know, I I think he's going to be right about the serverless thing as well. Yeah. And I think this sort of dovetails into this idea that a lot of times, let's say, and this is a broad statement, I know this, but a lot of times enterprises are seen as people that are, you know, companies, organizations that are a bit entrenched. They get entrenched in this one way of thinking and it was really successful for whatever time it was in. And then what Simon does with mapping, right, is he's basically like, so where is it going next? And you can actually start to see where it will be going next so that you can make that strategy. So you can make your strategy work and it's not blaming the execution, but the strategy itself by understanding where the market is going or where organization needs to grow and where it should go next. Hi, everyone. I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Dexsecure. Dexsecure empowers web developers by automating tasks that are essential for every website, freeing up developer time to focus on building. Dexsecure currently has three products to help your team. Their web asset optimizer optimizes content like HTML, images, CSS, JavaScript, fonts, videos, and more. Their third-party optimizer takes care of all your third-party assets, and their intelligent network optimizer enhances the performance and resiliency of your website. Dexsecure also has an open source product called Open Dexsecure, a cloud agnostic edge development framework. Now what I love about Open Dex is that the developers can jump straight into product building and not worry about dealing with setup and all the other roadblocks that come from the complexity and configurations of other popular CDNs. If you're interested in trying Dexsecure's products, you can for free. Just visit Dexsecure's website at dexsecure.com to sign up and learn more. That's D E X E-C-U-R-E dot com. However, he also mentions a few different folks in at the end of, uh, of that clip we just listened to. And it dovetails really nicely with the fact that one of them works at or worked actually rather now at Liberty Mutual. And it's one of those enterprises that does understand where serverless and the cloud where the cloud and then therefore then serverless was going and adopted a serverless first approach. And so let's listen to a clip with David Anderson and from our episode serverless first engineers and the flywheel effect. Yeah. And this is where you asked him if he could sort of define uh, serverless first and what it means to Liberty Mutual. From a few different efforts of, of change, you realize that sometimes if you're, if you're extremely detailed up front, you turn people off. So we just started talking about serverless first and a different way of building. And we started to slowly define what that meant. So we started to say things like event-driven, um, well-architected. We talked about the serverless first spectrum, you know, start with serverless and manage services and work your way back through, you know, containers and even back to like, you know, the likes of Cloud Foundry, et cetera. So really giving people that prioritized list to work backwards from. Um, we talked about engineering excellence, is that we will take great pride in how we build. We'll have empowered teams. So we kind of, we grew it to be slightly bigger. We'd be driven by a KPI 
and not just, you know, not just writing a feature, but actually driving a business KPI. So this all led to teams that were more self-sufficient and more responsible. And again, there's a couple of really nice things for Liberty Mutual. One of the phrases was responsibility is our policy. We're like, yeah, we can work that into it. Um, one of the phrases with auto was the fact that only pay for what you need for your auto insurance. We thought, okay, that sounds like a serverless thing. You only pay for what you use. So we started folding in the corporate kind of directions, which are really solid and linking them back to what the engineers were doing. Engineers loved this because it was all of a sudden tying us to the business. And then when we did sit and talk to the business, we were talking the same language. So I've not consistent language from the engineering teams to the business leaders. It just, it just was incredible. This idea of experimentation as well. You could try things really quickly and see if it worked. And then it, it, you'd have the scale there if needed. So it's just about tying those, tying those things together the whole time. So it was, it's just fascinating to see how it grew. So I, I think this was really interesting, the evolution. It was sort of like, it was like a skunk's work project almost inside of Liberty Mutual where <laughs> they just started talking about this slowly, like, what's that movie, Inception, right? Where you're starting to plant things in people's brains and then slowly it becomes their idea maybe. But I think it was really interesting how Liberty Mutual sort of uh, did that. And I love this idea of common language. That is something where uh, we talk about that, you know, even with like the reason for getting an AWS certification, for example, is so that when you talk to other team members that are working on similar projects or the same project, that you have that that common language to uh, to fall back on. Yeah. And I think uh, Liberty Mutual certainly is an example, a model here, right, of of how an organization can embrace a common language, how people can grow within a mindset and then adopt it across an organization. And I think they're also sort of still an outlier in a lot of ways, or, or organizations are certainly moving in this direction, but they were an example for a reason. They headlined a lot of things as serverless first for a reason, because they're one of the largest and first to really adopt this like full scale and like grow it over time and speak that common language across, across their org. So this doesn't happen all of the time. And in fact, I think it's surprising, almost more surprising right now when it does happen rather when, than when it doesn't. And so with that spirit in mind, Jeremy, I'd love for you to talk about this, this next clip that we thought was quite interesting to juxtapose this with. Well, yeah, I mean, and this was, this was the interesting thing to me uh, is that you've got this enterprise that is now adopting this really new technology and they're finding a ton of success with it. And of course, you know, Matt Coulter and... Uh, Christy Peralt and all these other people who are out there now talking about what Liberty Mutual is doing with serverless and the success in an enterprise is really interesting. And for me, when we talked to Tom, I was sort of like, you know, who's the typical, uh, this is Tom McLaughlin, by the way, um, who maybe worked at Liberty Mutual for a while. I, I you know, I can't confirm or deny that. But when we talked to him, I asked him, what is the, who's the typical serverless developer or who's uh, is serverless typically for? Uh, and I was really surprised by this answer. I, I don't, for, first, I don't, I don't think there is a typical company, but one of the things I have noticed is, and, and this is something I think we discussed a few years ago, that serverless, back in like 2017, 2018, we thought serverless was going to be all the rage among the startups. And it really wasn't. It ended up becoming more so at, at, at the top, the big enterprises. And, it, and it's kind of working its way down. So that's, and so those are a lot of the people, and again, I've worked with, I've worked with small companies, startups and, and the enterprise. So I, I, I've seen both ends. So that, so yeah, there is no typical company, but particularly the enterprise, you have folks that are in a large company. They have been doing things a certain way for, for quite a while. And they're now, you know, they're now being tasked with change. So it might not just be, you know, an, an architecture change. It's part of say digital transformation or, or service modernization. So, you know, it, it's, it's all, it's tied together with these larger initiatives. I want to follow up on that. I mean, I was also working at AWS on the serverless team, right? And we had uh, d definitely sort of like messaging for enterprise and messaging for startups and everything in between. And I'm so curious, since you have been in the business for a long time, if you have a why behind, I mean, it was sort of surprising, right? As you said, you thought maybe Starbucks would adopt it first and it would work its way up, but really it started, or you saw the most adoption or desire for adoption through digital transformation at the enterprise level. And then maybe some startups end up using it as well. Do you have a hypothesis or maybe you have like 
you know, cold hard facts where you're like, this is actually why it was more adopted at the enterprise level. And here's the reasons why we were surprised, but it, it didn't actually catch fire, let's say, in the startup land. I, I think in the startup world, let's start there. I, I think Kubernetes ha- was was just so attractive just because there was the mind share and, you know, you could like, you know, throw a wrench somewhere and hit, you know, some infrastructure person that could set up Kubernetes for you. I, I don't, you know, a lot of, it's funny, there's a, there's, 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 um, there, there, there's a meme where this person has a like toy car and it's on like a giant flatbed truck and they're like, deployed my WordPress instance to, you know, to serverless. And yeah, I, I think there's just this in, in the startup world, it's like, oh, we got, we, 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 we do Kubernetes cause we're going to be that big, but we're going to need all of that. And we don't know what we're going to need tomorrow. So we can't tie ourselves into AWS. We need this agnostic platform. So that, you know, and, and I see that appeal, I disagree with it, but I think that's why it's really taken, you know, it's, that's why I think it's still very common in, in the startup world, you know, that this finding the people with the skills is really easy. You can find somebody that knows how to put, how to put some software in a container. You can find an infrastructure person that can set up and run Kubernetes for you. So, all right, cool. Let, let's just go with that. Um, on the, on the enterprise side, the enterprise is really fun. I, I would tell anybody, take some time in the enterprise. If you just want to study like organizational culture, like pretend you're an anthropologist, it's really cool. So let I, I, I can't I'm, tell. I'm I can't to... tell if you're being facetious or not. It... I literally just read to Jeremy. I was like, "Enterprise is really fun." I was like, "This is likely the first time I've actually ever heard this." No, it's it's very it's <laughs> it's so interesting because you start talking when when you look at the enterprise, you're just kind of like, "Well, why is that giant five thousand person organization or fifty thousand person organization making this sort of decision?" And then you have to start kind of going through the org chart and you can actually trace sometimes the logic of certain decisions by looking at the org chart. So my, my favorite is go try and sit there and, and, and sell, you know, a, a, a IT exec on, Hey, well, you know, if you, if you go, if, if, if you go serverless, great, you can, you can transfer headcount and resources over into, into development. You know, the people that make money take stuff out of the stuff that costs money to run. And it sounds like a compelling argument, right? You know, who doesn't want to make more money and spend and spend less money, you know, running all that stuff. It's great until you realize that, yeah, the people that like, you know, do the development and the people that do the operations are two completely separate, like separate, you know, like VPs or something like that. And. No, and for each of them, it's, 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 it's amazing that like for each of them, actually that argument doesn't only not resonate, it actually doesn't make sense for them. So you, so, so the person that's, that's running infrastructure, they don't want to give up, you know, their, 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 their budget and all, and like the headcount and stuff like that. So they're incentivized to, you know, let's, let's have, let's, let's have this. And you tell you go to a develop, you go to an enterprise, you know, a, de- a development VP, and they're like, "Well, I can also use Kubernetes because somebody else is already providing this." And I know I'm just now talking about why people would use Kubernetes instead of serverless in an enterprise, but that's actually one of that was actually something I saw once before because it was just the just the the org, you know, going through the org chart and trying to, and seeing that like people had different motivations. And people looked at the arguments that we give in, in, in just different terms that we're, that we're, than we're accustomed to. So I think enterprise oh, anthropology sure. sounds like a, a really bad yeah. suit shop or something like that. But, it, uh, um, so I, mean, uh, I just, think, I just gonna say, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think, I think, you know, if, if the reason I say go into the, go into the enterprise and it's just. Once you start seeing like an org chart, you can understand how decisions get made and it's fascinating completely fascinating to understand all this stuff but why would ser- well, but you know why would a why would a development team inside an enterprise go serverless one of the reasons is you will have other you will have other IT executives who will disagree with that you know with with the uh, with that first executive's thinking that sure we can just have that other group run all our infrastructure you'll have another team that says no but we actually want to be more nimble you know that 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 infrastructure and IT group is 
serving a 5,000 person organization and you're a small hundred to maybe 200 person development team, it's kind of like, well, would it be pretty cool if we could actually just have, you know, if we could respond more, more quickly to our own needs instead of having to filter everything through them. So that is, again, so that's one reason why it, within an organization, yes, you can def field, you will see teams adopting, you know, the, you know, serverless within the enterprise. Yeah. So this clip, I mean, it just, I remember both of us were typing back and forth to each other as we do. That's how we take notes. And in, in, in case our listeners don't know, we were, we both typed something at the same time, which was something like, wow, this is the first time I've ever heard this, or what a surprising right. statement, or I've never heard like the enterprise is super fun nor this idea, which, which is not to say that it's, uh, I think we were both like in our heads, we're like, yeah, it, it's serverless is it, it's nimble, right? It allows you to really move quickly. Um, so this idea that startups, it's like well designed for startups and it is, I think that we don't often hear that enterprise story a lot where it's like enterprises are the ones that want to be adopting this. They're usually like that idea where it's like slower and harder to change. And I think this answer from Tom was just was memorable not only because he's clearly been on all sides of the spectrum working with different sizes of organizations but also memorable for me because you and I both had similar like huh moments and so that's why I think I, I really wanted for all of us to re-listen back to this right and I, and I actually think it was an interesting sort of uh, as you said this this idea of like you you would normally flip it the other way. Like I would think when he says, you know, you can throw a wrench and hit somebody that knows how to set up a server or do containers. He's actually very right about that. I mean, that is that is something that lots of people know how to do. When you start talking about more specific things like serverless and so forth, uh, it does get a little bit niche, right? And you have to find people that know how to use DynamoDB and people who know how to use, I mean, now start talking about the more niche services like AppSync and EventBridge. Like these are things that require a, a fair amount of specialization in order for you to understand and then be able to use them correctly. And I almost got the sense from, from Tom that there was a little bit of frustration within enterprises from the people who work on, who work on these teams who are like, why does it take six months to get an API endpoint provisioned, right? Like we need to move faster than this and we need to be able to do these things quicker. So I can see the reasoning behind it, you know, and certainly from a corporate standpoint, trying to, or from an enterprise level standpoint, trying to justify the savings that you're going to have and the productivity boost and all this other stuff uh, makes a lot of sense, but it is a big cultural shift. And then on the other side of it, though, I do think that, you know, there, there is something we need to sell with serverless that we're not selling. That is this idea of, you know, yeah, there's maybe some complexity to it and so forth. And again, we've got to make serverless easier. This is a question, you know, this is a topic we could go on for hours about. But the idea of being able to say something like, if you're a small company, a one person, two person, three person startup, how you build something is maybe a little bit, I guess, less important than whether or not you're building the right thing. And I, I, I might've given away too much there, but, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't think you gave away too much. I just think you set it up so well that I would love for people to go ahead and listen to this outtake with Swizzit Teller um, from the episode Serverless for Front End Engineers and talking about iterating quickly and building the right thing and what that means for teams. One of the things with software that's really nice is that you can iterate fast, but then we're putting all of these roadblocks in our way that make it hard to iterate fast. And it's only that fast iteration that really makes it possible to build something that people want. Because I feel like in most companies or in most environments, it's much more likely that you're going to build the wrong thing than it is that you're going to build the right thing wrong. Because if it's the right thing, you can always fix it later. But if it's the wrong thing, right. it needs to die as soon as possible. Yeah, so I mean, that like, this is one of the best quotes I think we've had from 135 episodes was, uh, you know, if you know, it's much more likely that you're going to build the wrong thing than it is that you're going to build the right thing wrong. And this happens all the time. It's like if you I've tell I tell startups all the time or any company I consult with, uh, especially before before serverless came around, I would always tell them, like, don't worry about scale. If you get to a point where your systems are really stressed um, and you have to scale up, there are ways to do that, right? That may not be super great, but 
let's hope you have that problem, right? I mean, that's where you want to get to. And that very much so ties back to what, you know, I, I think what, what Tom was saying where, again, yeah, great, let's spin up a Kubernetes cluster and containers and do all this crazy infrastructure just to get up a, a, a point, uh, you know, a proof of concept. Well, guess what? If nobody likes that proof of concept, you wasted a lot of time engineering infrastructure that you could have completely abstracted away with serverless, and even if serverless didn't scale to where you needed it to scale to, which it most likely would, but even if it didn't or there was some whatever there, you, if you get to that point, that's a great problem to have. Yeah, and I think this ties back not only to Tom's, but all the way back to Simon Wardley, right? Where it's like, it's the strategy at the very beginning. It's not the execution that you have to blame. It's also the strategy where, what are you building if you're going to build the wrong, the, if you're going to build the wrong thing, that's a strategic decision at the beginning, like get to that, uh, get to that knowledge point way faster, right? Understand that you're building the wrong thing before you go build, before you go build it, essentially, it'd be much better to build the right thing wrong. Yeah, totally agree. So we're running out of time. And I actually thought we were going to get through all of these things very, very fast. But too, we're um, always I think so in the interest... <laughs> we are optimistic. <laughs> Things always take 12 times longer than we think, or 100 times longer than I think we think they're going to take. But anyways, I, I want to I get through one more of these. And then I think what we'll do is we'll take a break. We'll, we'll come back and we'll do, we'll do another one of these uh, next week and, uh, and, and follow up with some other ones. And then we'll have a few more guests before, before we take our summer break. But I do want to get to this because, you know, we talked a lot about enterprise and we talked a lot about small businesses and talked about building things right and, or versus, you know, uh, the wrong thing versus building the right thing, whatever. So there's a there's a lot of complexity in all of that. And Liberty Mutual is a gigantic organization. They've got tons of developers that they can use. I mean, I, I forget how many thousands of developers they have. And so they can go through all the motions and they can worry about compliance and they can worry about security and they can worry about all these other things. If you're a small business, though, or you're a startup, I mean, there's a lot of risk in setting up Kubernetes or something like that because you might need someone to manage it. You have security concerns. You have all these other things you have to deal with. And we had the pleasure of talking with Merritt Bear and Megan O'Neill uh, in episode number 131, and we were talking about security in the cloud. And you, uh, you asked her about a quote that she, that she uses quite a bit, uh, that hope is not a plan, and sort of asked her to, to discuss that or, or tell us a little bit more about that. And I, I found her answer to be very, very, uh, very, very interesting. I take very little credit for it. I think it's kind of an, an Amazonianism because I have uh. also heard it from Eric Brandwine, and that's usually who I attribute it to. But it is, I think the idea is that good intentions are not enough. That, um, you know, like, we believe that humans are, you know, as Anne Frank would say, inherently good at heart or something, you know, but that that's not enough, right? That ultimately there needs to be mechanisms to get the job done and that mechanisms allow us to also scale and to be able, because we can not only be able to hand over to the next person sort of a playbook of what we've been working on, but also to allow us to automate away. Because if it's a mechanism that, so for example, our SIM system, initially, every SIM gets answered by a human. And then increasingly, it get, gets answered by a robot. Because we realize that there are things we can automate away. And then meanwhile, we hire people who love automation, you know, security engineers who can code, which often means we hire devs to be security engineers, which means that one of their, you know, goals is to never close a trouble ticket until you've scripted a remediation, if it can be scripted. You know, so it becomes this whole, one of the big questions I get is like, how do I build a culture of innovation, a culture of security, a culture of, and it's like, you build a culture of what you repeatedly do. Culture is what you do on purpose over time. And I think, you know, if you want to do those behaviors, then you exhibit them, <laughs> you know, like, and the way to exhibit them is to create mechanisms to encourage and, and foster and, and kind of, you know, grow those. So culture is what you do on purpose over time. I would follow it up, but I think the silence allows it to land a little better. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it just, it, the, the point I think of what she's saying here again, and, and, and of course, there's, she's got a lot of uh, talks and, and, and writing too that you can go and check out. And I encourage you to, to, to follow Merritt and, uh, and, and see what she's, uh, see what she's talking about. But some of the things that kind of hit me here too is that, you know, security is 
is super important, right? You can't just, you know, hope and pray that uh, everyone's going to be a good soul and uh, there aren't going to be any nefarious, uh, you know, nefarious actors out there that are going to do stuff. But what I also liked about this was this is very much so an evolution. You don't get it perfect first. She talks about every time they get a trouble ticket, the, the culture or the process is to then automate the remediation for that so that it's you see something new and you figure out how to deal with it and then you automate that so that you continuously are lowering your burdens while can you know but, but still getting better at at what you do and then just having that mindset is a, is a really important part of uh, of any team's culture yeah and i think i mean she and megan exemplified this really well throughout the entire conversation if you um hadn't heard this episode before highly recommend you going back to it i feel like Hope is not a plan and culture's repeated actions are just two of the many takeaways, especially when applying it to security, where ultimately it comes down to the like, it's a foundational P0 and it, it maybe seems unsexy. And I think we talk about that in episode two, but really it's kind of the most exciting thing you could possibly solve in an ever evolving cloud world. Yeah, totally agree. All right. Well, so I think we've given our listeners a whole bunch of uh, of things to digest. If you have not listened to these episodes, they are great. Uh, our guests are absolutely amazing. We are so lucky to have such amazing guests on this show uh, and have the opportunity to talk to them. So we will put in the show notes for this show, we will put all of the links to the shows that we mentioned here. And Rebecca, you have something you'd like to say. I do. You know, Doing this was sort of like a love letter, right? Like going through this retrospective, looking at some of these moments. I'm glad we get to do a second episode to finish off the other ones that we haven't gotten to next week. But it's sort of, it's a love letter to our guests, right? This episode is, it's a love letter to the great moments across the past 30 episodes and across the past one year. But also, Jeremy, I really want to say doing this exercise was also sort of a love letter to you as a co-founder of serverless chats and as a co-host i really just want to take this moment and say like you are such a cool host to have these conversations with you give credit where credit is due you celebrate others work you share enthusiasm you build up other people's ideas you build on other people's ideas and so while i was going through some of these episodes that we've done together while well, I thank our guests so much and I thank the fact that we got to share these really great moments, I really want to thank you too. You've really set something up and I think brought a space where our guests can share a lot of their expertise and hopefully our listeners appreciate it too. Well, I, I appreciate that and I, of course, appreciate you. I won't tell my wife that you wrote me a love letter, but <laughs> um, but that's okay. Uh, no, I, I think it's, I, I, I thank you very much so for that because that is one of the things that I had strived to do with this show right from the beginning is to say, I have this privilege where I get to talk to these amazing people. And it's just not fair that other people don't get to hear these conversations. Now, maybe the bad part is, is that people have to listen to my side of the conversation and they can't just listen <laughs> to the guests. But uh, so they, you do have to put up with me in order to get the good, uh, the good stuff from the guests. But yeah, but that, that is an important thing to me. And I just love, I love what these people are doing. I love the, the community. I love the, the, just the, the, you know, the, the whole ecosystem uh, and the innovation. I just floored by the technology and where it's going. So, um, so yeah. So I, you know, I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate what you said there, and uh, and I hope the guests appreciate it, and I hope the the audience uh, appreciates listening to this. Yeah. If you do, or if you don't, let us know. You can find us on Twitter at Serverless Chats. All right. Well, we'll put all of the shows that we mentioned, or all the episodes we mentioned, in the show notes, uh, and we'll be back again next week with another best of episode. And that's this week's Serverless Chat. Rebecca and I want to give a huge thank you to all of our guests featured on this episode and to our sponsor, DeckSecure. If you want to check out the show notes and a full transcript of this episode, you can find them at serverlesschats.com slash 137. For more Serverless Chat, subscribe, sign up to be an insider, check us out on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can connect with Rebecca on Twitter at Becca Odele and me at Jeremy underscore daily. And if you want to keep up to date on everything serverless, make sure you subscribe to the Off by None newsletter at offbynone.io. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to chatting with all of you again next week.